climb. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the podcast, Jill Homer. Jill, how are you today? I'm great today. How Good. are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm super pumped to have you on. Um, apparently, we both live in the same city, and uh, I don't think I've ever met you. Is this our first introduction that you know of? Most likely. It's possible we've run into each other on a trail and just didn't know it. I mean, that's probably is how Boulder works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, so great to meet you. And um, yeah, I just want to talk about everything because you are not only an author, which uh, I'm a big fan of literature. I love reading. I love writing. Um, you're also an uh, ultra endurance athlete. Um, I look at your, your pictures and I see lots of running, lots of biking, lots of camping and lots of snow. So I can't wait to hear about it all. Um, do you consider yourself like more of an ultra runner or ultra biker or, or don't you consider yourself? <laughs> well, I, I do both. Um, the biking came first. So that's okay. what I've been doing the longest. So okay. I was a biker who came into running, but it's been long enough now. I did my first ultra in 2010. So ah. long enough that I've have a good background in both. Yeah. You have both titles by now. <laughs> Um, how did this all start for you, Jill? Well, actually, before we get into that, um, when I think of you, uh, I must have seen like a, one of your Facebook posts or something a while back, but like I said, you live in Boulder and I think I saw that you got hit by a car on Flagstaff at one point, like pretty recently. <laughs> did, yeah. Wow. That's actually been my current struggle. Um, in October, I was riding my mountain bike up Flagstaff road and I actually live at the top of Flagstaff. So I was riding home. Uh, okay. Um, and it, the sun, like it was a bad time of day. The sun was in, in my face going up the steepest part of Flagstaff. That's known, cyclist known as the wall. The wall. Yeah. Um, I ride up and down Flagstaff all the time. I actually live at the bottom of Flagstaff. So okay. Yeah. I'm familiar. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it was a, a driver and actually another guy who, who cycles, but uh, he also was, he, he like fixes up old trucks and he was testing out his old Ford F-250, but anyway, he didn't see me and hit me with his side view mirror. And the impact was enough that the mirror swung into his window and broke his window of uh, the passenger side. And so he stopped. I initially just went down on, like I, the because the window, or I'm sorry, the, the mirror swung back. And then so I slid along the side of his truck and initially just hit the road on my left side. So that was most of my initial pain. He did stop and we talked for a bit. Um, it was really disorienting because he was bleeding because his window had shattered and it was like an older truck. So the glass was very sharp. And Whoa. Um, I, at first I thought I was okay, but I've been having some back pain since then that I've been oh, trying to. No. Yeah. Okay. That sucks. Um, is that the only thing that's hurting from this? Uh, yes. It's really just my back. Like initially I thought, oh, I'm really like pretty much unhurt. Like my elbow was sore because I hit on my elbow really. That's where it hit? I, okay. I hit the road, oh. uh, but he hit my back with his mirror. And so that, that kind of came later as these things sometimes do. I'm learning. Okay. It's actually kind of common with car accidents that you don't initially, you know, when people crash their cars, they don't initially feel pain in certain areas and it comes a little bit later. So yeah. Yeah. I know. I've been hit by a car twice in my life. Um, have, you? <laughs> have you been hit by a car more than once? No, I this do is a lot of cycling. my first time. Yeah. First no, time. I, I've been cycling for so long and I considered myself pretty lucky in that regard, but yeah, my luck ran out oh. <laughs> last October. Okay. So this back injury, how debilitating is it at this point? Like, are you, able uh, to it, it, I would, it's not bad. No, but I have been going to physical therapy and, um, I did get, you know, the x-ray and everything. There's no, there was no fracture in my spine, but it is just sort of this ongoing stiffness. There might be, you know, some little bit of scar tissue there and, you know, pinched nerves. So I've been working on it, but it's, it's improving. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, speaking of just random Facebook posts that I may or may not remember, um, did you get married like right outside of Boulder in the mountains recently? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, my husband and I, we've been together for a while, um, okay. but uh, we, we got married last September. Cool. Or not last, I'm sorry, no, it was September 2020. Oh, Sorry, okay. you know how the, these years go, they're all blurring together right now. <laughs> the last few just blend together. <laughs> um, we got married on top of Bear Peak. Ah. 
you know, and we wanted to have a really small socially distanced outdoor wedding in September of 2020. So yeah, we, we put together just a pretty small ceremony on top of Bear Peak and very it was a cool September day, beautiful sunset. So awesome. Perfect. No, I remember it because my wife and I got married on top of uh, Red Cloud Peak uh, like six months ago or so. And so I, I just remember the mountaintop <laughs> yeah. wedding and remember the picture and thinking, oh, look at these guys. That's so cool. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it was, it was really lovely. I'm, you know, it was, it was a nice day. So nice. Good, good. I love it. Well, let's get into it from the beginning, Jill. Like, tell us how this all started for you. If I read correctly, you grew up in Utah and it looks like according to your Instagram, you are all over the place. You do a lot of traveling, but yeah. How did it all start? Well, I, yeah, I grew up in Utah. Um, I, I've always really liked camping and travel and hiking and adventure. Um, but in 2005, I decided to follow a man to Alaska, sort of, you know, <clears throat> was my, not my current partner, husband, but a former okay. boyfriend. Yep, yep. Was like, I want, you know, I'm going to Alaska. And I'm like, okay, I, you know, so I, I got a new job in a little town called Homer. It's right on the sea. Um, Homer living in Homer. Yeah, I'm that's, sure that's, that's a right. That I, got, I got of. a lot of comments for that. <laughs> okay. Um, and when we first moved up there, it was kind of like winter was coming. And I'm like, oh, I need a new, you know, I need something to keep me occupied during the winter. Um, and I did try cross country skiing, didn't love it. It was, you know, crashing a lot. And I, th I was really into cycling at the time. And I learned online kind of almost by accident that people like ride their bikes in the snow in Alaska. It was mm -hmm. pretty new at the time. Fat bikes were around, but they were, they were pretty like new. They, okay. they were just really just starting to hit the mass market at that point. And so I'm like, oh, winter cycling. And then through that, I discovered that they had this hundred mile race called the Sitna 100. And I'm like, hundred miles on the snow in Alaska. And, you know, it was just all very exciting. And I just got in my head that I had to do this and I had never really done anything like it. And I had never really been like a competitive racer at that point, you know, sure. just I'd gone hiking and camping and even growing up, I didn't really play sports. Mm. So it was just this completely new kind of out of left field thing. And all my friends and family are like, oh, but you're going to die. Like, don't, you know, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but I, I started training and I was very dedicated and um, my first race that I did was in February of 2006 called the Sitna 100 and it was the conditions were really difficult and it took me 25 hours to finish the race and again I never been like I'd never been out all night you know and I was all alone in the wilderness yeah. pushing my bike a bunch because the conditions were quite soft and um but then I was hooked. I nice. Just, I, you know, I was that sense of accomplishment that you feel when, when you've finished something really hard yes. and, you know, you've prepared and yeah. And so it just kind of went on from there. I started doing 24 hour bike races and got more in, interested in like longer distance, multi-day stuff, that, like multi-day bike packing. Um, and so that's when I started doing like the Iditarod, mm. which uh, did the 350 in 2008, 350 miles on a bike. Okay. Yep. And then you I got did first the, place. The, yeah. Don't leave that out. <laughs> and um, the, the tour divide in 2009, that was my nice. doing the, uh, the 2,800 miles from Banff to Mexico. Wow. On the Continental divide. Wow. Great divide mountain bike route. Okay. And you've gone longer too now, right? Have you done the the longer version of the Iditarod? Yes. Yeah, so that the 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 book that uh, that I was going to send to you is about that. Okay. Uh, but that that's the thousand mile, which I did in twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen. Finally finished that, and yeah, I was able to set the women's record that year. Nice. It still still stands, but beautiful. <laughs> and what was the time on that? Uh, it's 17 days and three hours. Days. Jeez, that's crazy. Okay. So you go from a non-athlete all the way to, I did a rod thousand mile women's champion. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we went through it really quick there, but okay. So a lot to unpack. So when you first started cycling in Alaska, were you doing that on a fat bike? Did you buy a fat bike right away? 
so I did not buy a fat bike right away. I couldn't afford it. It was really the reason I would go to REI and like stare at the purple Pugsley they had on their, on their wall and just like covet it, but I couldn't afford it. So I actually originally did my, I did my first winter race on a regular full suspension mountain bike. Ah, no kidding. Inch, yeah. That I bought okay. back in 2002. So Gary Fisher sugar it was a great you were, bike. <laughs> you were able to pack that with all the stuff you needed. Yeah. I, I packed it. I had a, a frame. Or I'm sorry. Um, Seat post. Okay. What is it like? Yeah, you like cl click into your seat post and you can put paneers on your bike? Yes. A rack. <laughs> it's okay. A seat post rack. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then I hung stuff off the handlebars. But yeah, it was a pretty funny setup. That was one <laughs> of the reasons I was so slow. Was <laughs> I was not really well geared for the, for the soft conditions. With because that normally a full suspension mountain bike would not be ideal for these conditions. No, it really wasn't ideal. You know, it had 2.1 inch tires. I had to glue them, like still had tubes in it. And I got, even got studded tires, but I had to glue the tires to the rim because <laughs> when you take it down to low pressure, uh, the tire starts slipping and you can, you can break the valve stem uh, on your tube. So okay. it's the old school setup. <laughs> so you're learning all the tricks along the way too. I mean, yeah, so I, I learned that racing in the winter must come with a lot of tricks. <laughs> it does back then it, it was, it was kind of, it was funny back then. Like there was just a lot of unknowns and you know, there wasn't nearly as much on the internet as there is today. So sure. yeah. Yeah. It was just sort of like, well, how, how can I make this work for me? And you just come up with your own ideas. So that was pretty fun. Yeah, too. totally. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of the same for me with ultra running. Like when I got into it was probably around the same time. And there just wasn't a lot online. Like there was a couple blogs that I had read through thoroughly, like three times. And then the Dean Carnaz's book, of course. And, and then now there's just a plethora of information online. You can find whatever, whenever, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So you got your first race under your belt, uh, 25 hours. Um, what were the challenges in that first race for you? Um, you said it was the first time you were out all night. Um, I remember my first ultra out all, all night, but yeah, what was it like for you? Well, just, it, it was pretty Cause out there, even on the hundred miler, you're pretty out there as far as there's, you know, they, they send you immediately like out into the wilderness. You're off the, you know, at some points, like 50 miles from the nearest road. And there weren't many, like I was kind of toward the back of the race. So there weren't many people on the trail around me. And yeah. <clears throat> it just all was like really in intimidating, but also really empowering to realize that I was like, I'm on my own out here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of that and just really trying to manage my self care. I actually amazingly did okay with that my first race, as far as, you know, I had all my snacks and I had already researched well what I could, what would not freeze in those temperatures, you know, chocolate and nuts basically yep. was the, the gist of what I had with me, but I, I kept eating and, you know, I actually kept my energy levels up, but uh, the conditions were difficult because it started to snow pretty heavily. And then after that, it warmed up enough that it was even raining. And so you get just that really slushy, soft packed snow. And so then I got really wet, um, like... So now it's like 30 degrees and I'm soaking wet. Mm. And so I did have some difficulties keeping myself warm in that condition. So that was challenging as well. So what did you do? Just pedal faster? Um, well, I was, I was mostly walking at that point. Okay. Um, but I, <laughs> I did, faster. I did, you know, try like my toes were getting cold. And so I remember I, I stopped, I had like this pair of neoprene socks that I brought with me that, that actually worked, but I stopped to put those on and yeah. like, like kayakers wear them. I know they're actual like neoprene, like wetsuit okay. socks. Ah, okay. So what are some of the other self-care tips that, um, you need to do to take care of yourself in a winter, uh, long distance mountain bike race? Um, and, and what sort of gear are you required to carry as well? Well, um, they usually, they do require you to carry like overnight gear. So sleep, you know, basically you're all geared up to camp if you need to, yep. um, because if you have any setbacks or if you, you know, you just need to be able to stop. And, and so you carry winter camping gear, um, eating actually is really important that, you know, that's how your body makes heat is keeping that internal furnace stoked. Yeah. 
um, you know, cause your clothing only retains the heat. If your body's not making any heat, you're not going to mm. be warm. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's really important. And yeah. And, and having layers and, and trying very, your very best not to get wet. So mm. you want to have a good solid pace, but you don't want to be going all out and like sweating a lot. Sure. So. Yeah. That could be the end of the day for sure. Yeah. Um, camping gear. I'm sure you're traveling really light, but what, what exactly are you carrying on your bike that, that you can fit? Well, I, you, you do have, like, I, I still have a full rack set up with panniers and, um, on the handlebar, a great big bivy bundle is what I call it, but it's a, okay. it's a sleeping bag rated to 40 below, hmm. like a mountaineering sleeping bag. Um, I like to use two closed cell phone pads on the, you know, for, heat retention, you know, I, I feel like those are best for heat retention. I don't like to use inflatable pads because I don't quite trust them. Okay. Um, those do take up a lot of space. And then over that, just a, a bivy sack to mostly to keep snow out. Mm. And keep mm. Got it. A little bit of wind protection. Yeah. But on that first race, I'm guessing you didn't use any of that camping gear. No, I didn't. So no. they do require you to carry it. I had it. Um, and I had less, my gear now is much better than it was that first time. Sure. Like, yeah. Again, I was kind of a real, I was a poor journalist at the time and <laughs> not the cheapest stuff I could find on eBay. Yeah. That was <laughs> eBay days. You go <laughs> and buy. That's how we make it all happen, you know, in the beginning. Yeah. And so I didn't use it. Um, I hadn't really practiced with it. And so I would have been in probably in some trouble if I, if I had needed to, but <laughs> Right. Luckily I didn't really need to. And, um, yeah, I just mostly just carried it. You know, I had my extra layers with me. Like I said, some that worked out really well, like those neoprene socks. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. And what were the feelings when you crossed that finish line, your first big race? I mean, it, it sounds like that's what hooked you in. Uh, what's going through your head? Well, it, it was a pretty incredible feeling. Um, I was really frustrated when I finished because I got a little bit lost right toward the end and did like an extra four miles just right at the end. Um, so I got in and I was, I was kind of angry and, and pretty dazed because I was very tired. Yeah. Um, but as soon as I crossed that finish line, you know, my boyfriend at the time was waiting for me and like the race director was still up, you know, it was, but it was a pretty subdued finish line as well. But, sure. um, and I was just like, yeah, I can't, you know, like he was so proud of me. And I'm like, I can't believe I did that. Like, it was just like this disbelief. And then like, this this relief and yeah. Just yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> nah, I love it. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, was your boyfriend at that time doing the same type of thing? Were you getting tips or anything from him? Well, no, it's really funny with him. We, we kind of both like dragged each other into the ultra world. Okay. Um, we did do like, we started dating uh, when uh, I was in my early twenties. So we've been dating for a few years at that point. Um, and he, we had done some big adventures together. We did a cross country bike trip where we biked from Salt Lake city to Syracuse, New York yeah. on, on road, like on touring bikes, you know, okay. on the road. Yeah. Um, we, we spent a whole summer in Alaska that as just, just as like a road trip, things really? like that. Okay. Um, but, but he hadn't really raced yet, but that year, he decided that if I was going to train and um, do the Susitna 100, he was going. He was more. Of a, he was a runner more than a biker. So okay. he's like, "I'm going to run the little Sue 50k." And so he did that, and he won like really handily, and started to figure out he was a really talented runner. So mm-hmm. he went on that trajectory, and he was actually really like successful in the ultra running world for a few years. Wow. It's been a little while now, but you've probably heard of him, Jeff Rose. Oh, yes. I know Jeff yes. Rose very well. That's, okay. that's him. Okay. That's right guys. on. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. Okay. Um, and not to make this awkward, but your current partner, you're happily married now, your current yes. partner is an athlete <laughs> as well, right? That's right. And that's how he and I met. So uh, Jeff and I broke up. I still hadn't really been, I mean... He, he was doing all of his races kind of in the lower 48 and I was still living in Alaska. I, I basically hadn't really been exposed to ultra running at that point to a, to a great degree. Um, but after we broke up, I decided I was going to move to Montana and take a new job at a magazine called Adventure Cycling. And part of my like 
you know, new year, new start to that was like, I, I might want to try running. You know, I've been doing this biking thing for a few years now. Yeah. I might enjoy running. Um, and so I volunteered for a race in Montana called, it was my friend was the race director and she's like, you should come volunteer. But it, they only held it that one year in 2010. It was called the Swan Crest 100. And I had several jobs during the whole like 36 hours of the race, but my last job was checking people in at the finish line mm -hmm. as we're getting close to our, I think it had a 36 hour cutoff, but getting close to that time and all the people I'm checking in, it was a really hard race. They had to go over avalanche debris. It was just, it was harder. I think that people were expecting it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching people come in that just look awful. <laughs> they're limping, you know, and they're bleeding. They're covered in mud and, they look like they've been through some kind of war. <laughs> yep. I just was like checking all these people in like, oh, this, you know, actually this does not look like a fun sport. <laughs> you know, bikers, we, we can, we know how to have fun, but these people are just miserable. <laughs> right. Um, and, and then my, the man who is now my husband runs into the finish around hour 34. And he had just has this enormous smile on his face really caught me by, you know, like he was in a great mood. He was really, you know, and instantly very chatty, yep. like started talking up a storm about his race and how, and I told him just, just a tiny bit about myself. And he's like, oh yeah, you should run hundred miles. You could run one next week. I'm going to run one next week. And I'm like, <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> um, and the way that goes is, yeah, he made that impression on me. And then I friended him on Facebook, you know, the whole, I, I mean, I actually looked up his name in the, in the roster of finishers because I've forgotten to ask him when we were talking. And so basically went online and like social media stalked him. and <laughs> Facebook stalked him, yeah. Facebook. And the very first picture that I saw from him was some horrible picture of his feet, you know, because his feet were really <laughs> mangled in that race. And you're like, um, this is the man for me. <laughs> yeah, but he did do this other 100-mile race the very following week, which was the Headlands 100 in, in San Francisco. Whoa. Wow. And yeah, we just struck up an online friendship that yep. uh, developed over the, you know, and then we started long distance dating and I moved to California with him in 2011. So, okay. And he was, so he was living in California. You were in was, Alaska. At, well, at the time, so I, I spent a short time in Montana Mm. Um, I moved there to Montana on my own to take a new job. And then when I moved to California for a little while, I was working remotely for the magazine that I had been working okay. for. Montana. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah. Tell me about the writing too. Like, how did that all start? Uh, you said you were working journalism and now you have, how many books do you have? A lot. Um, I think I have six, six books. Nice. Um, okay. Yeah. How did that all start? A little project. I mean, I, I was one of those kids who always wanted to be a writer. Um, cool. You know, I have some like essay I wrote when I was five about how I was going to grow up and write books or so, <laughs> yeah, like, a little older than five, but, um, so, I, and then I studied journalism in college and, and I, that's still a big passion of mine, small town journalism. I actually still work for several Alaska newspapers that oh, I really, did. yeah, nice, for, you know, remote work where remote, I, I do yeah. editing for them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I'm still involved in the journalism world and still very passionate about small town community journalism. Mm. Um, and also, but like working for newspapers got to be really, just really difficult and really like soul draining toward, but that's when I left Alaska to work for magazines. And that's when I broke, broke away. I went freelance. And so now I just do all kinds of different projects. And okay. Adventure writing is almost something I do as, you know, more, more the hobby that I have, but I do love it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm envious of your life. I mean, the writing, the adventuring, I mean, it's, it sounds like the dream life. Um, so when you're, when you're writing a piece for one of these magazines, do you typically write it first and then try and shop it around or are they hiring you to write a certain article for them or how does that work? Yeah. When you write for magazines, usually you have an idea and you, you send them a proposal, like, are you interested in this idea? Um, and they say yes or no. So okay. that, that is, and a lot of the like work work I do is, is more on the editing side. So, mm. okay. That's your specialty. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. Like I said, the right, the writing, like I don't, I don't have tons of articles out there because most of the writing I do is like the blog and the, and the books, you know, the. Got it. Okay. Um, but how did it go from journalism to now you're writing about your own adventures? I mean, it, it sounds like six books in you've, you've found your voice. Um, like what was the transition there? Well, I, I, as soon as I took up racing in Alaska, I started blogging. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's really how that all started was just really learning to love this, this format of, of storytelling. And, mm -hmm. um, so I'd say that, yeah, that's how that started. And I'm, you know, like everybody else, I'm not nearly as active as a blogger as I used to be. Right. Um, that, that's kind of faded, but I, I really do love that, like kind of long format, having an adventure and telling the story of the adventure. Yeah. So, yeah, me too. Me too. Um, yeah, well, that's really cool. So, okay. So you sit down to write your first book. I'm curious about this too. And, and remind me, what was the name of your very first book? So it's called ghost trails, ghost trails. Okay. And it's about the first I did a rod race that I did in 2008. The 350 mile one? 350 mile, yes. Okay, okay. So you had done the race, and then how much longer after that do you sit down and, and decide it's it's time to start writing about this? Well, I, I start doing that right away. So what was funny about Ghost Trails is um, while I was training for that race in 2007, I was doing a regular appearance on an NPR show called, what was it like the Bryant Park Project? Okay. Uh, no longer broadcasting, but it was sort of like my weekly call in, um, to a podcast type thing, except for it was, you know, back then they were, they were radio programs. Okay. It was on at, at five 30 New York time. It was based in New York city. So every time I called in, I had to call in at one 30 Alaska time in the morning, <laughs> um, and talk about my weekly training. So anyway, I was kind of, I was already like kind of building up some interest there and the producer for the show was like you really need to write a book so okay I, that so i started pretty much immediately afterward working on that book okay okay um when you sat down with the book project in mind did you know exactly how the whole book was going to lay out from beginning to end um um were there questions in your mind were you sitting down literally to like a blank pad of paper saying i have no idea how this is going to go or did you have a pretty clear cut idea well, it's really what I wanted to tell, and that's been the theme with a lot of my books, is, was sort of like, how did I go from this, like, person who, you know, heart was, like, scared of everything, you know, and grew up in Utah and, like, really doesn't have this type of background. How did I go from this start to racing the Iditarod 350? Um, and so that's, that's the story I wanted to tell that book. So I, I set out to try to tell, you know, like, to try to, to show that that story as, as best I could. So, okay. Okay. so you know, so I, I actually alternated between past and present. It, it was a style that, that works in some ways. And in some ways I look back on it, I'm like, oh yeah, I probably should have done this differently, but telling past stories and then relating them to a present part of the race and, and just mm. how, what I learned. And so, okay. That, that, that's why I wanted, to, I wanted to tell that story. Yeah. Okay. So it makes sense. And I'm just trying to picture it. So like the, the book is narrated while you're in the race and you're like thinking back to other times in your life and telling those stories. Yeah. Well, and it does, it, it doesn't really say like, oh, and this reminds me of, it doesn't really have that transition. It just jumps like okay. every chapter is like a different point in time. Yeah. So there's a chapter of like this day of the race, like February 28th, 2008. And then the next chapter will be like, 1996 you know sort of like and I I tell different but they're all kind of like related to this point where I am at in the race so it's like in the race I'm on this journey from a complete beginner really to someone who has just had all of these experiences mm -hmm. um in the span of a you know of a six-day race but then that also kind of relating that to my journey to get there in the first place you know and I was yeah a little kid hiking in the forest and then cool cool well i like the whole premise of the book it's it, it sounds cool um and like while you're out on these big adventures you think of your entire life 
you know, so it's sort of fitting. Like, um, I mean, you have time to think about everything. You know, I find myself thinking about buddies from first grade and where's that teacher from second grade. And it, it's crazy the things that go through your head. So definitely that book just, it, it makes sense. I get it. Um, okay. So, and, and then like after that first race, were you thinking the Iditarod right away? Was that something that was on your mind or was that just a far off pipe dream? Yeah, that did. I, lear I learned about the Iditarod in, in the process of training for this race and immediately captured my imagination. Like, oh, that, you know, crossing this wide swath of Alaska and going to the Alaska range. And, um, but I did take a couple of years more to prepare for it, but it really was like, it was on the radar after that point, like everything I did from 2006 to 2008 was sort of like preparing to get ready for this first race. But it's funny, even with all of that in mind, I, I really had no idea what I was actually getting into with the, with the first I did a Yeah. Just how, yeah, <clears throat> how bad the weather would be at times and really? how okay. tired I would be after that many days and just other various things that really were again, just a really like crazy, amazing and crushing experience. So. <laughs> um, now, correct me if I'm wrong. The Iditarod has a, a few different races, right? Like you can ride, ride it on a bike or you can pull a sled or can you ski it as well? Or mm -hmm. tell me how it goes. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's, of course, the original dog sled race, which runs somewhat concurrently. It starts a week later. Okay. Then, the, then, then they have a human powered race, which has two distances, the 350 mile or the thousand mile. And it, within that human powered race, there's three modes of transport that you can choose. You can choose at the last minute if you want to, but it's biking or they call it running, but it's, you know, pulling a sled and, and hiking really for most everyone. There have been people in the past who've been able to run a lot of it, <clears throat> but, uh, and then they're skiing. And interestingly, skiing just isn't as popular of a moto, like it just not that many people do it. I think it's just, there's probably because there's not as many skiers in the world as there are runners and bikers. And just the nature of the conditions, it's not, they're not nice groomed trails. There's a lot of ice, there's a lot of dirt. There's, you know, just mixed conditions that aren't necessarily that friendly to skis. So skis aren't really necessarily the advantage that you'd hope they'd be. Yeah. But between the bike and the running, I'm guessing that's why they allow you to change your mode of transport up to the last minute if you want to, because <laughs> the weather, could, the weather could support biking or it could support running and you really won't know until a couple of days before. That's true. And e even as someone who does both things, if I don't concentrate my training one way or the other. I wouldn't really feel comfortable changing it at the very last minute, but you can. So some years are just really snowy and they're not, they're not really that conducive to biking. Like 2020, the last, <clears throat> you know, they held the race that started right before the pandemic really took off. Um, but that was a very snowy year where the bikes didn't really thrive. A lot of bikers made it though, but I was actually out on the trail walking that year with a, you know, pulling a sled Okay. with my snowshoes on and spent a lot of time around other bikers who were pushing their bikes. Okay. Yeah. A lot of hike a bike. A lot of hike a bike. Yeah. Like what would the percentage of hike a bike be? Because I've never done a race like this. Um, <laughs> you know, I've done a fair amount of mountain biking and I should be asking you more specific races that I'm interested in doing rather than the I did rod, but oh. like <laughs> Percentage wise, how much would you say you're actually hiking the bike? I mean, it really depends. There's always some, obviously you're never going to get perfect conditions and you've got a really heavy bike. So anytime you hit a steep, you know, a really steep slope, you're probably pushing your bike. Mm -hmm. um, it, it ranges probably like the most it would be is even like around 50%. Okay. Um, but it can feel like a lot more than that. When, right. But 2020, I say it was probably a year it was like, 50, probably 50% hike a bike for okay. people. Just the snow was too soft. And, yeah. but with modern fat bikes, you can actually ride a lot of really soft and difficult conditions. It's just hard work. I mean, it's like out there on, you know, if you imagine like riding like a paddle track or something, it's. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Okay. So 
the very first I did a ride, 350 miles. Um, walk me through a couple of the challenges of that one. And, and, and how long does something like that take? Well, that one took me six days. six days. That one was challenging because I did the first half in 36 hours. And then the second half took me four and a half days. Okay. Um, Do tell. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I got great conditions at first and I was really racing and I was really, you know, having a lot of fun. Um, and then I got smacked on the, the, you cross over a mountain range on Rainy Pass. You cross over the Alaska range. I got smacked on that crossing because I just got, I was, I wasn't, hadn't really slept yet. And I wasn't really taking care of myself for that length, you know, to get out for that length of time. And then it got really cold. And then I actually got into, I dropped my bike into some water and I froze all the gear, you know, the, really? the, um, <clears throat> I, I just had, I had some struggles getting over the pass. So yeah, I did. I, I was crossing through some, through some water and I just dropped my bike and, um, so that's all that the gear whole, in your bike. Yeah. Frozen all too, the right? gearing froze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, I couldn't get it to like, I couldn't get it to pedal. And I was lucky because I was close enough to this remote checkpoint where they actually let me take it into the cabin and, and thaw it out. Okay. <laughs> otherwise, but anyway, I had trouble there and then it just, the conditions were very difficult after that. And again, I wasn't, I hadn't taken care of myself well, and I was really starting to pay for it with just like really deep fatigue, um, nausea, because I, you know, my, I bonked pretty severely and I just was never able to recover that. And um, then the wind kicked up and it was really, really windy and cold, <laughs> you know, just like sort of you know, I was just out there trying to survive yeah. really, you know, and I did okay. I wasn't ever injured and I, you know, I did okay, but I, I really like kind of my mind kicked into like, okay, survival mode and slowed down a lot. And back, that was actually back before the race had spot trackers. Okay. Uh, they adopted those in like 2011 or 12. So I'm just out there and there's no communication. And, you know, my, this is my first Iditarod and my family's kind of like, looking for updates and there's nothing, nothing, nothing. And so they basically, they all think I'm dead. Oh like, no. <laughs> even, even Jeff, my boyfriend at the time, you know, as soon as I got into the first, the, the final village of Nikolai, the first thing I get is a phone call from him. Like what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it just, it was just a kind of this comp, these compounding fatigue and really difficult weather that, that was all very challenging. Okay. And how much sleep were you getting out there? Well, it, I mean, at first it was like, I was sleeping maybe like two hours a night and really not even that. Cause it was like, I would lay down and mostly not sleep. Cause I was just so excited and, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, um, the, there was a, I started to sleep a little bit more cause I was so tired and there was one night where it was like 35, 38 below zero where I was sleeping out of my sleeping bag. And I tried to get up like two or three times where I would get out of my sleeping bag and just, you know, I'd be so cold that I would just panic and get back in my sleeping bag. And so that night I was in my bag for, I think about 12 or maybe even four, no, I think it was 12 hours. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, yes, these rests got, the rest got pretty long too. So <laughs> now just a, a matter of like, I just couldn't, and I now know how to get up out of my sleeping bag at 40 below and pack up and not freeze to death, but you yeah. feel like you're going to freeze to death. Yeah. Like, no kidding. I I would. Okay. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. And then crossing that finish line, like uh, again, was your mind on, I wonder if I could ever do the thousand mile or where was your head at that point? Well, at, at first it was, it was like, I'm never going to do this again. Like I'm done. That was, <laughs> um, and it was also just sort of like, wow, like, I feel like I felt like a different person. Like, I felt like I had been through a complete life change or something, you know, like I just sort of my, my so, you know, something was rewired in my brain. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I feel kind of like a new person now. And, and it did when I, you know, went back into the real world and back into my job and just day-to-day -day life, it was like a complete culture shock, just like, um, but the desire to go back did, did come back 
pretty quickly. Okay. Um, yeah. And I actually attempted the same race the following year and had a really early mishap where I fell into some water and I got frostbite. Oh no. To drop out of the race. So. Okay. So the first time it was just your bike that fell in the water, not you. Yeah. Yeah. And then you fell in. Uh, then I, I mean, fell, I fell in and it, I, on like the first night, like basically I was like four hours into the event when I uh, fell into a pressure crack on Flathorn Lake. Um, so really soaked like one whole side of my body and got a bunch of water in my boot. Again, it was another that night that was like 35, 40 below. So by the time I got into checkpoint one, all the water in my boot had frozen solid. You know, my foot was encased in this ice and yeah. it was a pretty, pretty serious case of frostbite. Really? Um, I, I still have all my toes, but to this day, I have nerve damage in my right foot mm. that has been a challenge. So, yeah. So how far did you have to trek from where you fell in to your next checkpoint? Um, I ended up, it ended up being like 25 more miles, um, but it was pretty slow going. I think I was out for like eight hours after I fell into the water. So, wow. did you know, you and know I, made, I made mistakes too. Like I could have dealt with that better than I did. I should have stopped immediately and you know, and got, gotten in my sleeping bag and just tried to dry off, but okay. I made okay. mistakes and that's, you know, you learn along the way and yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, something like that's not going to be perfect right away. So, I mean, but, uh, did you know your foot was in trouble? Like right away as you're hiking to that checkpoint, like, no, yeah, it's funny. I, I, I thought I would be, fun. so I had these really nice boot mountaineering boots that were waterproof, you know, unless water comes in from the top, which is what happened. Okay. Um, but I'm like, oh, the water inside my foot will probably just warm up the water, you know, and I'll just, I'll have some water in my boot, but it's not a big deal. As long as I could wiggle my toes, I think I'm fine. Um, so, and I was also getting off, like the trail was fairly rideable, but I was getting off my bike, like trying to get off at like 20 minute intervals to run for five minutes. Okay. Um, and then I get back on the bike and wiggle my toes. I'm like, okay, my toes are still wiggling. I believed I was doing this the whole way there, but at some point it was just all in my head because my foot was encased in ice. And so I probably was not wiggling my toes, uh, but I believed wow. I was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So that, that's kind of how I kept up that delusion until it got pretty serious. So okay. yeah. it's interesting when you, when you freeze your foot, like you don't feel it. It doesn't really hurt. Like it, it, I think in that case, it happens so slowly but it just sort of like nicely went numb and then it froze. Like it just doesn't, you don't feel a thing, which is kind of scary. Yeah. But then it hurts afterwards though, right? It hurts. Oh yeah. Yeah. When you thaw out a foot like that, when you've done that much frost damage and then it thaws out, it's unbelievable pain. Yeah. It felt like it was something was holding a blowtorch to my foot. And I, couldn't, I couldn't move it. Just like incredible burning pain. Wow. <laughs> So, not recommended. Not recommended. <laughs> um, did that make you hesitant at all to continue winter ultras, or did you just feel like, ah, eh, that was a one-off, not the not the biggest deal in the world? Just just avoid that next time. No, it did. I, yeah, that. It's funny. Like I basically did qu quit after that. Um, it was that incident, and then going through the breakup with Jeff, and then kind of changing my life and moving to Montana. Mm -hmm where I'm like, I'm probably just done with this. You know, that was my life then. And this is my life now and moving on. But um, it really was meeting my current husband, Bayot, that uh, pushed me back, like <laughs> fully back into it. Nice. Um, which was again, funny because like I said, I met him at a summer race in 2010. He lived in California. He had never done anything like that. I told him about my winter racing in Alaska and he's like, we should do this. And he, we kind of go to each other into doing the Sitna 100 on foot in 2011. So okay, I fell right back into it that but it took a couple of years and Got it really, it. Was, it was his fault. It's his I'll tell fault. you that it's my fault that we do this stuff, but I, I think it's his fault. Cause I, <laughs> I probably would have just left it behind if it wasn't for him. So, well, it sounds like it was meant to happen and you're meant yeah. to be doing this stuff. <laughs> right. So right on. Um, did you guys run that race together or did you run it at your own pace? No, we did. We, we weren't originally planning to, but he, he stuck with me. And I, I had never, like I said, I, I kind of went into it, not even being a runner. And I did my first 50 K like three months before the race started was my Whoa. first ever 
that was actually like my first running race was a 50 K in California. Anyway, so I, I got into the hundred mile really, really fast. I was, I thought I could lean on my, my ultra biking experience, but I was in a lot of pain, <laughs> my <laughs> killing me. Um, so he stuck with me and, and, you know, we had, that was a really difficult year for that race. It was just very cold, very windy, very slow, but mm -hmm. saw it through. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys together were off and running at that point. It sounds like. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he really, I, I kind of continued to I, 100 milers. I was still doing another 100 mile race on my bike, the White Mountains 100. Um, he really took it like full bore and he did the 350 on foot in 2012. And then he did his first walk to Nome in 2013. And he's been going back ever since trying to walk to Nome every year. He's just completely addicted. So, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm not super familiar with, with your husband, but yeah, I, I saw that he had done the thousand mile more than once. Is he doing other races as well be, besides the Iditarod or is that his main focus? Yeah, he's, he's definitely become a creature of habit. He used to do lots of hundred mile foot races. Okay. Uh, now he likes this longer stuff even more. So the thousand mile is obviously a big time consuming thing he does in February, March. And then he really likes to do these races in Europe, um, the Tour de Jean. Ah, nice. The 200 yes, mile. Of course. And then there's one connected to UTMB called the PTL. It's like yes. PTL. Okay. Um, he does those almost every year. Wow. So, okay. And there's usually some, like the, the URA 100 is a, is a hundred mile in Colorado that he really enjoys. Brutal. Okay. And he'll do the hard rock if he gets in, but, uh, he was in hard rock a couple of years ago, but then they canceled it and then he wasn't able to get in again, but. Okay. Okay. So he's not, uh, just like handpicking the easiest races out there. He, no, is... he really only, he pretty much only likes the hard ones. Yeah. He, he really likes the mountain races. And so that's mostly what he focuses on. That's cool. In the summertime. Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine you guys supporting each other with your races and sort of inspiring each other throughout the years too. Is that kind of what it is or? <laughs> yeah, it's really, been, we, we both are really into this, this kind of thing, you know, and so it is sort of, we're enabling each other in a way. <laughs> it sounds like it, it. I think it is great for both of us that, that we both have an understanding because I think it would be harder to have a part. If you're really into this kind of thing and had a partner who wasn't necessarily on board, that would be difficult. So very difficult. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. No, so you found the right person. Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> Um, and I took a look at your ultra sign up and you've done a lot of trail races. I mean, I think that you're more known for being on the bike and your bike races, but you've done a lot of trail running races. Yeah. Um, I really, really enjoy trail running. Um, I, in, when I was in California, I, I ran a bunch of 50 Ks that, that was one of my favorite things to do on weekends was California has a different 50 K pretty much every weekend. So yeah, right. your choice of. So that, that's a lot of my races on, on ultra sign up, but yeah, I, I've enjoyed over the years. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like it was pretty heavy in California and, um, races not local to Colorado. Um, do you have an interest in any of the Colorado races or, or are you running less these days or where do you stand? Well, like, yeah, I do. I, I started like, it's, it's basically almost coincidence, but as soon as I moved here, I started having some health problems. And so mm. there's been that aspect um, asthma, which has made it more difficult for me at altitude. And, um, so that, that is one of the reasons I've run less in Colorado. I would like to, like, I, I did the quad rock one year and had a lot of fun, but yeah. Colorado trail running is hard. It <laughs> is know? hard. Yeah. <laughs> but you've done the bear 100. I think I saw, I mean, yeah. that's a legit mountain race. Yeah. yeah. I, I do enjoy those, but yeah, I'm not as talented as my husband, that kind of thing. So I've got to really prepare in order, you know, just to be able to make those cutoffs and <laughs> yep. just more run specific training. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So do you have like a, a, like a weekly regiment of miles that you try and keep up with, whether it's biking or running or what are your, what, what's your weekly workout numbers sort of look like, or is it something you don't even pay attention to? No, I do. I, I'm, I'm on Strava too. I have been very active on Strava. For okay for a decade now. Um, I do keep track. I, 
I have trouble with training because I like to do what I like to do. And it's like, if I want to go out and ride my bike for eight hours, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also sometimes dealing with different injuries that prevent me from either riding or running. So I'll focus more, but, um, I, I like to stay just regularly active. So I almost think of it as hours per week, like trying to, to keep it around 10 or, you know, 10, at least 10 hours a week of activity. Okay. And, and I'm curious, do you do anything else besides endurance stuff like yoga, strength work, anything else to so, sort of support your endurance? Yes, I am. Especially these days, I am trying to keep up better with strength work. Um, okay. I used to be a member of a gym before the pandemic and I haven't rejoined one yet, but gotten mm -hmm. a little better with my home routine, trying to keep up strength. Um, I have tried yoga. I've not gotten as much into it, but I believe that kind of thing is important. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm 46 years old. I'm not sure how old you are, but yeah. 42. A, 42. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, once you hit your 40s, like things oh, don't sure. feel exactly like they did when you're 20, you have to take care of yourself if you yeah. want to keep doing this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, this thing with my back recently with, you know, it didn't really start till after I got hit by the truck, but it has been kind of enlightening to how much your core matters and having a strong core. So mm, yeah, happy big time. About that. So what kind of core exercises are you doing? Like, I, so mean, I got this other is giving me several, like, you know, but it is a lot of planks, planking, pushups, uh, deadlifts, uh, you know, that kind of thing. All the usual. Yep. The yep. Usual. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So we're up to the thousand mile I did rod. <laughs> um, what year was this? Uh, that was 2016. 2016. Six years okay. ago. So. Yeah. So paint the picture for what's potentially going to be like the biggest adventure of your life. And I'm, I'm guessing there's got to be at the beginning of this, it's like, who knows if I'm going to finish this because it's so long, so many things can happen. Um, how are you feeling walking up to the start line of the Iditarod 1000 mile bike ride? Well, it's funny. I mean, it had been on my dream list, obviously, for many years at that point. I guess I started, started this whole thing 10 years earlier, and it felt like I'd been building up to it for 10 years. So I lot, had a lot of expectations of myself, and my everything leading up to it just went kind of poorly. Again, I started having these health issues. Um, my training wasn't going that well. I had just It felt like I was having setback after setback. And so by the time I showed up at the starting line, my confidence was just about zero. And I was sort of like, I'm just going to take it one day at a time, you know? Sure. Um, and it worked that way, but, but yes, I, I definitely like people who've read my book. That's often what they point out. I was like, you had a lot of self-doubt. And I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the latest book that you wrote, right? Um, it, well, I have one that I wrote after that about walking to McGrath in 2018. That's, that's kind of a shorter book, but okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, um, uh, I, this was just recently released as an audio book. So it's the one I've been promoting for that reason. Recently. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Okay. And, um, did you read it for the audio book or did someone else read it for you? I did not No, I, I, um, worked with a producer in Arizona. I okay. think she did a great job. So, okay. Perfect. But I am just a little... Yeah. I didn't, I actually just didn't want to do it myself. So yeah, yeah, I know I am a podcaster and I hate the sound of my own voice. So I, I hear you, but yeah, I, I don't know. This is, I guess a random question, but did you ever listen to Scott Jurek's book, the audio book, um, um, North? I read North, but I read it on Red North. I didn't okay. listen to it. Okay. So, no, no, yeah. no. You picked the right way because I'm just picking, <laughs> you know, some audiobooks are read by somebody else and just completely ruined, you know, but if, um, in your case, if the author approves of the way that it was read, it must've been done well. I think, I think she did a great job. Yeah. Okay. So. okay. Good. Good. Cool. Um, is that your only audiobook or is everything on audiobook? Uh, that that's actually the first one I've tried. Okay. On audiobook, so. okay. 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 Um, I'm going to be pursuing this more. It's funny. I just really myself got into listening to audiobooks, which is, gave me the idea. I'm like, I should, I should have my books produced as audio. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. it's another avenue, and a lot it's of great. people yeah, listen no, to I, books. I love audiobooks. I I've been like listen to them now on my. I have a bike trainer, and so I yep. really enjoy that. Nice. Same here. I, my bike trainer is right to the right of me <laughs> yeah. here. It's, there's snow outside, and that's what we're doing in Boulder. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, no, I love audiobooks and and yeah, people are listening to them like crazy. And I would think as an author, that's just another another avenue for you. So yeah, no, audiobooks are great. So yeah, I'm gonna work on getting more produced. Good, cool. And maybe cool. maybe I'll think about self narrating one, but yeah, I would need to find somebody to work with with the, you know the good equipment and stuff. And for sure, a sound room. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but tell us about this thousand mile race. I mean, what are okay? So. First of all, how long did that take you? So that was 17 days. Gosh. Okay. So break it down for us. Tell us how those 17 days were. Well, every day was, I mean, that's why I love doing these multi-day races. Every day is its own kind of new adventure with a new challenge. And some days, some days were like pretty amazingly easy. Um, and then some days that I, where I wasn't expecting it were just like crazy hard. And I get to the, you know, I, I was trying to sleep full nights every night that I, it was really like my whole mindset at that point, like sleeps, my confidence was so low, was about finishing. So I did everything I could to keep myself in that frame of mind. But yeah, some days I would just stop for the night and, and just think, I, I don't even know if I can get out of bed tomorrow. And yeah, you just get up and go the next day. I developed carpal tunnel during the race, which turned out to be a really like surprising setback because um, I had a pretty hands. severe case. Yeah. In my right hand, I, I got surgery on it shortly after that race, but it got to the point where I couldn't really use my hand, my whole, it just kind of like stiffened up into this claw and I could barely move my fingers because the carpal tunnel, the nerve deadens. And it just, I mean, I had trouble lighting my stove. I had, I couldn't really hit my brakes on my bike or, you know, my, mm. I think that was my front brake, but, um, with my right hand anyway, that was the kind of challenge where I, you know, completely out of left field. Like you don't expect to get carpal tunnel. Yeah. No kidding. You wouldn't think it'd be such a big deal, but it really was. Oh, well, yeah. I'm just picturing, I mean, that could potentially end your race. You can't use your brakes. You can't light a stove. Yeah. Can't... I just, or zipping up my coat. It was sort of like, that's right. what I felt, you know, I was riding close to this other racer named Mike. We, we often were at the same like checkpoints at night. So I told him like that, you know, as soon as I can't zip up my coat, I'm probably just gonna have to drop out of the race, but hmm. I was able to work around it for the most part. But yeah, it really got to the point where I just could not use my right hand. Wow. And before I got surgery, I mean, I'm right-handed. It got, you know, like I had to teach myself to be left-handed and for okay. a lot of, I couldn't even drive, you know, I couldn't use the steering wheel. It just, wow. Quite disabling, really surprising, but then the surgery really worked well for me. So. Okay. Good. Good. How far into the race did you start feeling this? Not far. So I had a crash on the first day oh, where I landed on my hand. And I think that kind of set off the old injury that triggered this carpal tunnel. Um, so it started on the second day of the race and it got progressively worse the whole time oh, no. before the end. It was, yeah, like having a useless, almost paralyzed hand. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm just picturing this. Like I remember one time I was biking at slick rock in, in Moab and I went over the handlebars and broke my hand and I was on a road trip with my buddy. And the next day we were going to run the grand Canyon rim to rim to rim. And I had a broken hand and, you know, just like duct taped it up and took some ibuprofen and yeah, I couldn't zip up my jacket. My buddy had to roll up my sleeping bag and tent for me. And I, I just couldn't do anything. So I can't even imagine you continuing this race with a hand that doesn't work. It sounds impossible. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm impressed with your story. That <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> not as impressive as yours. Let me tell you. Well, it just sort of like, it was. At first it was like, oh, it's just my hand, you know, like I'm riding my bike and I'm still like, it's not like I hurt a leg or something, but yeah. And it is sort of like, I was already out there. It's in some ways it feels like my one chance, you know? And so. Yeah. Okay. And you're riding a fat bike at this point, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, by 2016, I had a really nice bike. Ericsson built titanium frame. So Ericsson is, he's a frame builder who kind of works with Moots and Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Moots, but no. they, <clears throat> they build titanium. I, we're, my husband and I are big fans of them, but they're based in Steamboat Springs. They build okay. titanium frames. And so really nice light frame. Um, nice. Yeah. It was, it was a much better bike. So. Okay. 
So you got the bike. I'm guessing you have the better gear at this point. I mean, yes. you have to have everything <laughs> dialed in for the thousand miler. Yeah. By, by then I had, it's, it's all gear. I still use like I'm, I was really happy with my gear selection that year and I haven't really deviated from it at all. So good, good. Well, that's an important factor. I mean, each person has to have their own gear and they have to be mm -hmm. able to find everything with their eyes closed or in the dark and they have to know where everything is. And that's a very important part, but um, so like, what was your game plan? Are you trying to cover a certain amount of miles a day or certain hours a day? And it sounds like you're getting full night's sleep, which is the healthy way to go. Yeah. So that, that was my plan was to try to go checkpoint to checkpoint, but obviously I knew I would have to adjust if I couldn't make the mileage that I hoped to make each day, but I had a fairly conservative plan and, it, and the whole race actually went better for me than much better for me than I expected, which is why I was able to set the record. I just had, besides my hand, um, I had mostly good conditions. I had a few days of really bad wind and cold that were difficult, but, um, so I was able to cover, I was able to go pretty successfully go checkpoint to checkpoint. And because I was able to do that, I got some decent sleep. I only had to sleep out, I think four of the nights. Cause there's also, where well, there's not checkpoints, there's um, shelter cabins. And so I was able to find shelter a lot of the nights. Good. So. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, getting full night's sleep. So, I mean, you're, for a distance this long, you're sort of, it feels like you're taking your time, I'm guessing. It feels like you're going slow, sort of pacing yourself out. It is, yeah. For a distance this long, I mean, you you have to push it sometimes to sure. get through difficult scenarios, difficult weather. But yeah, it's definitely at your like low zone two, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. all day mode. Sure. That, you know, the ultra runners would, you know, they probably be like your walking pace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, okay. So you started this race with a lot of doubts. You hurt your hand. So you have even more doubts, but when do you find yourself in first place for the women? Um, that, that happened pretty early on. Uh, I, I mostly, and I think I ended up being the only woman who made it to Nome that year. So, oh. I mean, I, I won the race. I was also the only Okay. Female finisher. Got it. Um, finished about mid pack. I think with all the, like, there were, I think eight other guys who finished in Nome that year. Wow. Uh, so it got to the point where the other women were out, out of the race and it was just me. And, um, and really I was just trying to hold, I just really just wanted to finish. And, you know, as soon as I felt like my asthma was acting up, as soon as I was having any concerns at all, I would be like, okay, I got to take it easy, you know, okay. because I was being quite conservative and, that other guy around me, Mike, at one point towards like, three, I think we were like 200 miles from the finish. He's like, I think you're really close to the women's record. Like you could probably make it if, you know, it, but I was just like, no, no, you know, <laughs> I'm not even, I'm not even going to like think about it. Cause I just didn't want to, you know, wreck my chances of finishing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Like jinx yourself. Yeah. And so I actually, I never even like, I purposefully did not look up what the record actually was. I had this number in my mind that turned out to be, I thought it was 16 days. It was actually like 17 and a half days was the women's record at the time. And so even, even my final miles into the finish, I didn't know that I was really, so yeah. okay. wow. <laughs> so, um, but it's funny. I got, I got, I finally got a little bit of competitive spirit in me the last day. Cause I got completely wrecked in the morning traveling over the top cock hills which are just terribly steep hard hills and it was really really cold and um <clears throat> then I was passed by this musher named Jason Mackey and he he's the brother of a famous musher anyway he, he um he dropped his ski pole toward the end the mushers sometimes use ski poles to kind of push themselves along like to actually help their dogs it's, it's you know they'll actually seem kind of pulling a little bit along their on their sleds but uh he dropped it and I just got this idea in my mind that I'm going to race him to the finish and try to return his ski pole to him. <laughs> um, and so I did like for the last 50 miles, I really raced it. Like I wow. rode hard, you know, I tried to keep up with Jason Mackey because these dogs, I mean, they run about 10 miles an hour, even at, after a thousand miles, these dogs are just incredible. Wow, <laughs> It's hard to, hard to imagine, but, um, that was my goal was to beat him to the finish. And I did. Wow. And by like 15 minutes, but, um, that was basically the reason I was able to break the record is because I had that 
you know, I, I only broke up by about three hours and it was like that last. Wow. So that was it. Push, that was pretty much it. So, wow. Wow. That's really cool. Um, and you returned it at the finish line, I'm guessing you beat him in and then you gave him his, his trekking pole. Well, what's funny about that is there was, there's one final checkpoint and, uh, that all the mushers is it called safety and it's just a little roadhouse. Um, and when I, safety is about 20 miles from the finish. And when I got to safety, he had already left and I thought, oh, my chances are, I I've lost, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I left the ski pole there at the checkpoint. So sadly I did not have it to, like, but then I, you know, I continued and I was able to pass him on that final stretch. And okay. then I ended up getting there about 15 minutes before him, but yeah, wow. I no longer had his ski pole in my possession. It was ah. safety. So. Hey, that's all right. Um, you, you still made it into the finish. You beat him. Yeah. You did what you needed to do. Mission accomplished. Um, how many miles did you ride that very last day? Do you remember? Uh, so that would have been 80, that was an 80 mile day. 80 mile day. Okay. And like I said, it went pretty quickly. I left the white mountain village at about, I think around like 4, 4 a.m., maybe 5 a.m. And I was able to finish right around 5 p.m. So it was like a 12 hour wow. mile day. Okay. But just like, especially with the hilly, like first part of the day, it was very slow. That actually turned out to be a pretty that's a pretty good day for right. yeah, that hiking. Big time. I mean, yeah. what did you average most days for mileage? So, I mean, it was 17 days for a thousand miles. So my average, that would make my average about 55 miles a day. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds uh, a little some more. Some days manageable. were really short. I had one day that was only 14 miles. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Why? Yeah. Because of weather? Uh, yes. It was so windy. With That was our crossing of the sea ice. We only made about from the village to the first cabin is 14 miles. And we covered it in about eight, maybe even nine hours and decided we were gonna rest before we continued. But mm. that just was just like, almost like a standstill because the wind was blowing so hard. Yeah. yeah. Even pedaling the bike was like two miles an hour. Like it's hard to believe you can pedal a bike that slow, but you actually can because if the wind is basically blowing you backward, then it's just like, you just keep pedaling. Yeah. And it's just not even worth it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, okay. So that finish line, tell me how that finish line felt. Well, no, actually let's go back to the, the finishing line day. So when you woke up in the morning and got ready for your 80 mile day, did you know you were going to be finishing that day? Was that the plan? <clears throat> that, that was a plan. There was one more shelter cabin and I decided if I was completely wrecked going over the top cock kills, I was going to stop at that shelter cabin and at least get a nap. And that, that was actually my plan before encountering Jason and him dropping a ski pole, okay. um, which is why I say, you know, it was really like that sort of boost that got me to continue. But uh, I was, when I left White Mountain, I was like, I'm going to probably finish today. It's either going to be a really long day with a little nap in the middle or, you know, but hopefully yeah, it'd be fun to finish the daylight, which is what it turned out to be. So it's like early evening and yeah. the Iditarod was still in full swing, the dog sled race. And so... Lots of fanfare, lots of people waiting at the finish, you know, just, they were actually a lot, they were waiting for Jason because he's a pretty popular musher. Okay. Okay. Um, so I ride my bike up there and the announcer's like, oh, you right know, we've got one of these Iditarod bikers. And like I said, we're kind of, we're kind of outliers in that whole, like the Iditarod dog sled race is a big deal. And okay. we are, we're sort of outliers. People think we're strange and <laughs> understandable. And you and come in and you're like, around. Yeah. J Jason's <laughs> drafting off me. He's, he's right yeah. behind me. <laughs> <laughs> so I came up and they had an announcer. They had on webcam. So all of my family was able to watch from home. Nice. And um, that, that was, it was again, sort of a culture shock because I'd been really pretty alone for a long time. You know, I've been yeah. kind of running into Mike and I've been seeing other people at checkpoints, but lots of alone time. And suddenly I'm just surrounded by crowds and there was some fanfare and it was just overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. How do you do typically like with, with integrating back into society after a race that big, like, you know, I've talked about it before on the show, like even after a hundred miler, I typically go through like a day of kind of feeling low, a little bit depressed, like, okay, I got to go back to work. Here we go. This is going to suck. Like, is it the same for everybody? It is. And I, I've had harder races in the past. That one, I had a bit of a Goldilocks because I was my husband was out walking and I had to wait for him to get there and he took another week. Mm. 
So I just had this kind of like nice wind down period where I, um, I spent another week in Nome. Okay. I stayed with a, a, a friend of a friend, but she turned out to be super cool and like social butterfly. And she took me to meet basically everybody in town, mm. um, rode my bike, even though my hand was still a mess, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I just really like, was kind of like kind of a slow integration. I, I was, you know, watching the dog sled race and just having a lot of fun that week. And then um, then Bad and I went home the following after he finished and it just sort of like, I was like satisfied. Like, I feel like having that wind down was, and just have not expecting to have finished and to have finished and just mm -hmm. to, to have finally done it like 10 years of like build up to finally, finally going to Nome. And yeah. Yeah. And being the only woman that crossed the finish line and setting yeah. the woman's record. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, okay. So are you, have you tried to defend this title? Like, where are you at now with the Iditarod? Is it, is it just in your DNA and you have to go well, back yes, every year? Yes, I, I, again, it's so hard and takes so much build up. I've been going back every other year, but after that, I got it in my head that I wanted to walk to Nome. Um, mm. Right now, I've pulled back from that a little bit. I, I, I had pretty big health setback in 2017, so I actually was going to go back in 2017 and um, diagnosed with the autoimmune disease. That so just it would have been potentially deadly if I had participated in endurance sports. So anyway, I pulled back that year, but I kept that dream alive. 2018, I walked to McGrath, um, and then 2020 was my, I you know I was going to push and go to Nome. Uh -huh. But uh, 2020, so I'm out there with my sled. It was just really difficult year, really cold, really slow. Um, I I was putting in really long, you know, so it's not sleeping full nights anymore because I, I have to put in about 30 to 35 miles, like 35 miles a day of walking to, to you know, every single day to make it. And it doesn't seem like much, but then, you know, when your pace is suddenly like averaging two miles an hour and it's like, right. that's your best, hardest effort. Time management became a real issue and I was very tired and it was starting to seem like I just wasn't going to be able to make the 30 day cutoff, which is also like, you really need to keep it within that cutoff just to beat spring. It's, you know, really, but it, you know, the trail starts to thaw out in March and okay. Anyway, uh, when I got to McGrath, that's really also when the pandemic was starting to, is Mar March 10th of 2020. I think that's almost like the day most people believe the pandemic like started in the United <laughs> States, but um, it was becoming more clear that this was going to affect the race and it ended up that it did affect the race, that uh, these villages started to shut down. Mm. And so, but long story is, is I, I got to McGrath and kind of like, saw the writing on the wall on several fronts and, and stopped there. Yeah. Um, did they shut the race down? They did. Yes. So uh, they, they held out as long as possible. Um, but eventually when most of the racers, I think a few, a few bike, like three bikers did finish okay. before they shut the race down, mm. but m the majority of the field was still about around mile 700 when they stopped the race. It's okay. Like, mm. You're no longer welcome in these villages, and mm. you need to go. You know, they might shut down the airports. You should go home. So wow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So is this race still in your future? Are you going to go back? You still want to walk this thing? Uh, so walking is a little bit on the on the back burner for now. Um. I I was going to go back and bike. I still am planning to go back and bike the 350 this year. Cool. So that's what I'm preparing for right now. Okay. I was going to try to bike the thousand again. That that kind of became this reignited dream, but um, just uh, more various things. Like I said, I really I really want to be like completely on it to to try it, and my back is a concern, and there's a few other concerns. So I think I can be ready for the 350, but I'm not going to attempt the thousand mile this year for sure. Um, when does that start? What's the date of that? Uh, that starts February 26. Ah, okay. So, so a month one away. Month, one month. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Really so cool. Today I'm actually just, I'm actually today working on getting my drop, my, my bags ready to send out so that I have my food in, in the, in the checkpoints. 
Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, well, good luck at the 350. I mean, that sounds just amazing. It sounds so cool. Do you have any other races or big adventures like on the calendar or something, anything else that you're looking at? Yeah, but just like for a couple of years. So again, like pandemic just makes everything sort of like, I don't know, but, um, the Silk Road race is, uh, 1400 kilometer, so 1700, I get it, um, in Kyrgyzstan, Ooh. um, mountain biking. Yeah. Okay. In August. Okay. And this was something my friend and I were going to do together in 2020. Again, it's been pushed back. Um, but that's, that's a possibility for this year. You know, there, there are some issues we might need to work out. And again, I don't know about traveling to Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. How safe is it? Yeah. It's well, I mean, la last year they ended up holding the race last year, but there was a COVID outbreak and it's okay. kind of hard to, to gauge what, you know, what's the best thing or the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Considering that, but if I stay home again this year, I really would love to hike the Colorado trail. That's yeah. nice. Have you done it before? No. Okay. That's... Yeah. Me neither. <laughs> it's on my list. I've mean, done little pieces of it, you know, and I obviously do a lot of hiking in the Indian peaks, but, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'd love to, to hike the whole Colorado trail. So cool. maybe this year. So if you were to do the CT, would you try and like set an FKT or just take your time out there and have a good time? Or no, I, I, I thought it like when I was thinking about this a couple of years ago, the women's self-supported FKT was still in my wheelhouse. It was about 15 days. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, I can't remember who did it, but some woman dropped it to nine. And so I think that might actually be out of my capability. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'd still love to do it and, and still try to do it, you know, to see, to challenge myself and to maybe do it in the, the two week range. Okay, cool, cool. Well, Jill, this has been fascinating. Um, I can't wait to read your book as well. Um, are you writing right now? Or are you working on anything new? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always kind of working on a few projects. I've been really busy with my newspapers lately. So, um, yeah. but hopefully, okay. I'll, hopefully I'll put something together. Yeah, but no solid books in the works that you have in mind? No, nothing, yeah, nothing solid. Okay. Right Do you have ideas in your head like inspiration from a movie or you're walking down the street and you think, ah, oh, that is a book right there. And I think I could do that. I wish, one. I, wish I had more ideas. Yeah, <laughs> I need to purchase from people as ideas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I, I think a couple of your books are listed as memoirs, right? Like three of them. Yeah. So that's why, because when I do these adventure narratives that, you know, that fits into a the memoir. category of memoir because they're autobi autobiographical. And okay, yeah. Um, do you have the same publisher for all your books? Mm -hmm. You do? Yeah. Okay. What's the publisher? Art Glass Press. Okay. How did you come across them? I'm curious. Oh, just a, a small publisher. Yeah. Um, okay. So did you have to query them and uh, all, all of that like most writers do? Or did they somehow come across you? Or I'm just curious how this stuff works. No, it, yeah. It's just... Yeah, you you know, you just find a, a small publisher to work with and okay, okay, leaving your projects and yeah, and they've been good to you. I need got an editor, yeah, cool, cool. And you do most of your own editing, I'm guessing, right? Since that's your specialty. <laughs> well, I no, they hire editor for my okay, yeah, okay. Well, it's hard when I write, it's hard for me to look at my stuff objectively and be able to edit it. You know, it's like, I feel like this is a good sentence, but then when someone else reads it, they're like, ah, no, 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 you should structure it this way. It's like, like I can edit someone else's work, I think, but editing my own work is a little bit harder. I don't know if, if it's the same for you. Yeah, no, that's, I, that's like why I don't want to narrate my own stuff. I don't try, you know, I at least try to do some self-editing, but yeah, if I don't get somebody else's eyes on it, I wouldn't trust it. So yeah, yeah, cool. Well, I can't wait to re read your book. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Maybe I'll listen to it as well and, and give you my, uh, <laughs> give you my two yeah, cents. Let me know what you think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just looking forward to whatever's in your future, Jill, I'm going to keep an eye on you now. And, uh, I just want to hear about whatever's next. The next time yeah. you do big things, come back on the show and tell us all about it, but good luck with all the injuries. Good luck with the race this year. And, um, yeah, we're, I'm cheering for you from this corner now. So yeah, right. thank you for doing thank this. You. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thank you. you too. <laughs> okay.